All right, guys, this is for 8B. You should know how to explain different soil stages, characteristics of soil, uh, the layers, how we interact with the soil cycle, and how we affect things like that, um, and the element cycling and soil formation. All right, when rocks exposed to Earth's surface, it begins to break down through processes of weathering and erosion. You need to know, and we're going to get to this in a minute, that... Um, you really need to, to be able to differentiate between the chemical and the physical. And this is just basic science, basic chemistry stuff right here. So chemical and physical erosion, there are going to be a couple of processes here. There are going to be a couple of processes in physical as well. So just make sure that you're keeping track of this and making some sort of flow chart in your note card for that, okay? All right, so here we go. Physical weathering. It's the mechanical, mechanical breakdown of rocks and minerals. So what you need to know and what you need to remember about physical weathering is that there is no change in the identity of the elements. Okay, there's no change in the identity here, right? So that's you know, just a hallmark of, of physical changes, right? So that's going to be things like water breaking things down, wind coming and sweeping things away, um, tree branches breaking through, um, ice freezing and and expanding and then melting and condensing, which is a very special property of water. Uh, chemical weathering, this is the process you need to know here. Breakdown of rocks and minerals with chemical reactions, dissolving of chemical elements from rocks or both. And you know that from the last chapter when we talked about uh, primary succession, right? You had plants, algae, and so like lat 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 latching themselves onto rocks and then you know, taking up some of the minerals there, and when they die, they deposit these uh, chemicals that break down the rock, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Plants taking up minerals and depositing acidic compounds, right? Also bacteria that fix themselves to the roots, uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria. All those things are going to kind of have a, a hand in chemical, chemical weathering. All right, acid precipitation. Um, precipitation high in sulfuric acid and nitric acid from reactions between water vapor and sulfur and nitrogen oxide. Um, in the atmosphere, this is acid rain. And notice here, we're not talking too much about like carbonic acid from CO2, because that's something that just naturally happens. We're talking about things that are a little bit more out of the ordinary from human interaction, right? So these are the nitrogen oxides and sulfur, right? So these are the things we're talking about. We're talking about acid precipitation. These are going to contribute to weathering in some way, okay? And remember that um, acid rain directly contributes to chemical erosion, to chemical weathering of the, of the minerals, right? All right, so here we go. Here's a picture of weathering. This is ice. Remember that ice expands when it freezes and condenses when it melts. Tree branches coming in and breaking through these. Okay, erosion is the physical removal of rock fragments from a landscape or ecosystem, usually a result of two processes, wind, water, ice. It's down a slope. Keep this in mind, too, that the topography or the landscape, the shape of the landscape, right, is going to definitely play a role in the way that the soil forms. Okay, that's very, very important. The living organisms burrow under the soil, that's going to be very important, especially when we get into the different layers. Okay. Soil links rock cycle to the biosphere, and here's how. Okay. Soil serves as a medium for plant growth, filtration of water. It is a habitat and a filter for pollutants. So you might want to think about how humans interact in this and how human in actions how human actions are going to affect the biosphere how they're going to affect the environment and you now you can relate it not only to like trees and um, mountains and things like that but you can now look at soil right you can now look at how humans interact with soil soil usage right so you're just expanding your ability to kind of uh, talk about FRQs Ecosystem services provided by the soil. It's a medium for plant growth. So here's just kind of a graphic of that, right? Take a, take a look at that. Recycling system for organic waste helps filter and purify water. So let's take a look here. Breaks down material. Habitat for organisms. There's squiggly little worms. And filters water, right? Formation of soil. Soil is a mixture of organic and inorganic matter. The breakdown of rock and primary minerals from the parent material. And parent material is going to be the stuff way down here, right? Parent material is the base mineral at the very bottom, like your bedrock and stuff. 
And as we go further and further up, this is younger soil, right? The younger soil at the top. This is an old system, though, right? So we're talking about younger as in, like, the top layers here. But look here. As this gets weathered over time, um, you go from not too, too much loose stuff at the top, like your humus, your organic material, and you have just more and more thickness of this organic layer, right? Five factors determine properties of soil. This is a very important slide. Your parent material is the rock at the, underneath everything. It has the inorganic components that soil is derived from. Climate, right? If you have higher humidity near the equator, right? So we have a lot of humidity here. So if it is humid, right, what's going to happen? We have higher rates of decomposition. Higher rates of decomposition. In the northern latitudes, you don't have as much, right? You can have these really thick layers of it of organic waste material, uh, like leaves, twigs, things like that. And they're not going to decompose, right? So they're not going to have a lot of um, material for organisms, living organisms to pull from, right? Topography. You can have a very similar latitude, right? You can have a very similar latitude, but you may not have the same type of soil conditions, right? So imagine if you have something that's like on a plateau like this. So you have a plateau, and you say, so let's say we're in 60 degrees north, right? Two different places in the world, 60 degrees north. So the climate's going to be about the same. They're going to get the same amount of sunlight, right? Getting about the same amount of sunlight. But let's say that one of them is a plateau, and one of them has something that's more like this, like a slope, right? So when it rains on this one, all the soil is going to pretty much stay here. But when it rains here, right, all of our soil is going to kind of go... going to kind of go downward, right? All this stuff's going to kind of shift down the hill. The soil and stuff can slide down. It's not going to hold on to that. So these looser, mulchy top layers, right, these soft, loose layers are not going to stay on. So even though we have very similar latitudes, similar types of rain, similar climate, uh, the topography is going to definitely change change the way that you know the soil is going to take hold there. Right? The types of organisms you have for a given given area are going to definitely change the way that the soil forms, right? If you have a higher amount of worms or different types of uh, microinvertebrates, right, that's going to change the way that um, chemical erosion takes place, physical erosion. And then, of course, time. Like, the longer, um, the longer soil has to kind of get weathered, the, the more the soil is going to develop. All right, now we're going to get into horizons. We talked about this today. Uh, these are distinct physical layers of separation. And you can differentiate them by texture and color. Okay, O horizon. What I want you to remember about O horizon is O it stands for organic. And that's because the humus is there. That's what we call this detritus material, this detritus material here. I want you to know that that is your humus. All right. And I like how in the book it actually kind of gives you like almost the recipe to make hummus because people mispronounce humus as hummus. It's kind of weird. Okay, the A horizon, um, this is where your topsoil is at. You need to make sure you star this one because a lot of people are probably going to get that confused, even though it's underneath the O layer. The A horizon has your, your topsoil, and this is a, a place where we like to get our organic ma materials from. Um, this is really good for farming right here. Um, these two are mixed together, and this is aided by things like worms and other types of animals that burrow and mix these, mix these two layers together. The yeah, E horizon is not always present, but what you need to know about the E horizon is that the E stands for leaching, right? The E in, le e, e in leaching is for E horizon. The other word for leaching is alluviation. Sorry, I'm going to move this over a little bit. Okay, alluviation, both of these mean that they are leaking out their, their, um, their, their acids. Well, it says alluviation right there. I don't know how to write it. They're leaking out things into lower layers, right? The B horizon is mineral material, very little organic matter. Okay, so it's going to be very much more similar to the parent material. Okay, here's just another kind of graphic view of that. You want to make sure you have something like this in your, in your note card. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. 
All right, properties of soil. Here are some properties of soil. We have physical, chemical, biological, and we're going to look at these in lab this week. We're going to look at these in lab this week and next week, leading up to Christmas break. We're going to be doing lots of soil labs, and the goal of our soil labs is to eventually take that out to the garden outside, take it out to like some of the field trips we're going to do, and test to see um, what types of areas around San Antonio are going to be ideal for planting things that we want to plant. Our properties of soil refer to the characteristics such as size and weight, and this is when we start getting into our soil triangle here. Okay, and here, what we're talking about physical properties, we are looking at the, the percentages of sand, silt, and clay. And permeability depends on texture, and you're going to see that. Right. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We're going to zoom in real quick. So first off, you need to know that the order of particle size goes like this, right? So sand is going to be the biggest. Okay, sand is going to be the biggest here. Silt is next, a bit smaller. And then clay, very, very small. So which one of these do you think is going to have the highest level of porosity? Well, which one is when you try to stack them together? If you had a bunch of these guys right here, if you try to stack them together, are they going to leave a lot of open space? So let's see. So let's say I have another, another orb about the same size right here. And I stack another one up here. Notice that there's a little bit of space in between, right? A little bit of space right here, right? Even though I drew kind of like these nasty circles. Now, the silt's a little bit smaller. The clay, though, I could stack a bunch of these close together and there'd be a lot less space in between them. So this is actually going to have the lowest amount of porosity. So the least amount of water is going to be to percolate through clay. Remember that percolation just means forcing through something that's semi-permeable, right? Right, so ideally, we want when we look at the soil triangle, we want some sort of soil that's right about here in the loam, so sandy loam, which has 40% sand. So notice um, you always want to go for the lower number. If you're not sure which, which one to start at, because you notice you can get to this point right here from the 60 or the 40, you always pick the lower number. Okay, So right here I could go from 80 or 20. You want to go for 20, right? So the percentage of clay... You just go straight across horizontally. And for silt, you're going to go down and to the left. Notice not up and to the right, right? Because that would be 60. Down to the left. So pick the smallest values, right? If you have a choice between which, which direction to start from, always pick the smallest side. And also, when in doubt, look here. These have to add up to 20, 40, and 40. That's 100, right? So 100%. So you're literally going to have questions that do this. And in lab, what we're going to do is we're going to have samples of soil, and we're going to separate them out by volume, and we're going to try to see like where they would fall in the soil circle. We're also going to use this really hokey method of, um, of uh, trying to figure out what type of soil we're looking at by feel. Right? It's an old school method because that's what farmers do. Right? They don't have time to do all this you know, borophyll stuff. Chlorophyll, borophyll, I don't know what this guy's talking about, right? All right, so this is what we're literally going to do in lab right here. All right, we're going to take this sample right here. We're going to use some sort of dispersing agent, separate it out, pour out the water, and then do it again and again. And we'll eventually end up with something that looks like these three, and we'll be able to tell based on um, the volume they take up in a beaker. We'll be able to tell the percent composition. All right, chemical properties of soil help determine how soil functions. This is cation exchange capacity the ability to absorb and release cations. And remember that cations are going to be your group one, your group one elements, right, potassium. Remember cations are plus, like the T, right? Calcium, etc. So your most your, your group one, right? Okay, and base saturation is proportion of soil bases to soil, um, soil acids expressed as a percentage. All right, so you're looking at solid bases to so, uh, solid soil acids as a percentage, and you're going to look at things, it's the same thing, you're going to look for things like calcium that are um, combined with things that are going to be basic, and the higher percentage of these that you have relative to your acids, the better that your soil is going to be able to resist changes um, in acidity, which, you know, acidity is good to a, a really small extent, but they can injure plants, right, they can damage your plant life, so the bases are going to be there to serve as a buffer. And the biological properties of soil refer to the activities of the organisms there. Okay, there are three types you need to know about. The fungi, the bacteria, and protozoans. And we're going to do some stuff where we look at the bacteria in the soil. And um, when we do our eco-columns, I'm going to put some protozoans in there and kind of mess up some of your stuff. 
All right. Just remember that soil is living, right? It's not just not just the inorganic material and the organic molecules, but it's also the stuff inside that helps um, move things along for us, right? And they help the chemical processes there. It's very important, right? We try to remember that video, the little weird, like brown, poopy looking dirt molecules. It's representing the living processes there here. Rock and minerals are finite resources. We don't have them forever. And what we mean in that context is that um, they don't recycle as quickly as we're using them, right? So there is a, a, a set estimated time that we're going to have these, these uh, minerals in, in human existence for practical use, right? All right, so crustal abundance, the average concentration of the element in Earth's crust. What's important to note here is that we don't always have like even distribution of things. There might be one part of the Earth that has lots of tantalum. There might be other parts that have very little gold. You know, so these things are um, just averages, but they're not they're not necessarily distributed very evenly. Okay, or is concentrated accumulation of minerals from which economically valuable materials can be extracted. And we're going to talk about ways that this can be done. Our metal, an element with properties that allow it to conduct electricity and heat to perform other important functions. And reserve, when we're talking about reserve, we mean the um, amount that can be economically drawn over a period of time. Okay, you need to know that oxygen and silicon are the highest abundant um, ores and metals in the, in, the, in the crust, right, in our Earth's crust. And oxygen is going to be in the form of, like, rocks, right? So um, all, of, all of the oxygen we have in our atmosphere was at one point probably in some rock form, and when it goes into a volcano, it aerosolizes and becomes O2 that we can breathe. But know that oxygen and silicon count for over 70% of our metallic stuff in the crust. Okay, so check out our abundance here. It's kind of crazy, right? So... Global reserve, this is the estimated time in years. Iron, we have about 20. And in the U.S., we only have about 40. So this right here is a, is a source of contention for us economically. We have to import this stuff because we're going to run out. Um, aluminum, we have very, very little. All right, Let's check that out. Look here, we got nothing. So we're having to import this stuff all the time. But we do have an advantage when it comes to lead, so we could actually export that and gain economically. All right, mining can be above or below the surface, and these, some of these processes are amazing. They can be incredibly destructive, and um, we do have some legislation in process to kind of offset some of the, the, environmental, the environmental problems that come with some of these things. Let's see, so we're going to talk about um, strip mining. These are all surface mining. So strip mining, when you take things out in strips. Open pit mining, when you go a little bit deeper and make pits. Mountaintop removal, that's exactly what it sounds like. And placer mining, I'm going to show you a picture of that, but um, it's probably the... The type of um, um, mining technique you were probably first familiar with as a child. All right, so here, here are the definitions. A mining spoil is also known as tailings. This is the unwanted material when you when you get from mining, right? That could be like some of the dirt that's just left behind, but it's also a lot of the times a lot of the chemicals that are sprayed into the the soil to to help remove things. A open pit mining is a technique that uses large visible pit or hole in the ground. Uh, we use this a lot with things like coal, right, when we dig into the ground. But another way we remove coal from the, from um, land is from mountaintop removal. And you've seen videos of that where they just blow up the top of the mountain and level it. Um, there are some legislation, legislative processes in place to kind of offset some of the environmental detriment we do here. Placer mining is looking for minerals, and this is like the old school prospector, right? So whenever you think about, like, you know, going down to a river, right, it looks like this guy right here. He's panning for gold in the river. As my wife calls it, whenever I'm cleaning the kitty litter box, you're panning for gold, right? So it's kind of like this, right? The little kitty litter scoop. So that's placer mining. And then um, <clears throat> some of the... So this is really interesting like this. If you've seen this movie before, it's, it's exactly... It is exactly like the plot of The Hobbit, right? So they are tunneling in the mountain looking for the old, the, the Arkenstone, right? You've got, you know, Thor and Oakenshield here. This is all real, by the way. It's all completely real. See all these these elevators that they built? Yeah, this is true. It's all true. I mean, where do, they, where do you think J.R.R. Tolkien got this from? Just nowhere. He got it because this is what we're doing to the environment, okay? It's important. Subsurface mining, right? Mining techniques used when the desired resource is more than 100 uh, meters, and check this out, they tunnel into a mountain. 
like this, like they'll take a drill and they'll tunnel in horizontally. And then once they get to where they're going, they will make elevators that go up and down into the mountain, right? So they're literally making like these little crazy cities and tunnels and elevators and stuff like that. And they actually send people down these, right? So literally. Okay. So let's look at some of the effects that some of these things have. Surface mining. Effects on the water, contamination through percolates, right? Things that push through semi permeable membranes. Now, just remember that things like clay have very low permeability. So these are things you would want to line, like, um, uh, what do they call them? Landfills. They want to line landfills or things where we have, like, water um, that is not for human consumption. You want to line those things with, like, clay, right? Because they're not very porous. When the soil is removed from the site, it may be replaced if reclamation occurs. And this is an important term. Make sure you know this word, reclamation, because it's part of our legislative process that can actually be part of our success stories here. Habitat alteration, destruction of habitat, effects on humans. This is basically overall a super important slide. Air quality, water quality can be affected. Clean Air Act... Water Act is very important for these things. Okay, with surface mining, or subsurface mining, we don't have too much dust. The emissions from fossil fuels to get there, because remember, whenever you mine, you have to build roads, right? To transport things to and from there. So roads increase fossil fuel usage, which is going to increase CO2, right? So boom. So this is your cause and effect little... little flow chart here. So you got acid rain drainage. This is from, from uh, acids that they inject into the soil from they're having to remove things. And the effects on biodiversity, the road construction can fragment habitats. Remember that very good buzzword, habitat fragmentation. Then on humans, occupational hazards, of course. Respiratory diseases, black lung. Papa got the black lung. All right. But here's a success story. This is um, in Colorado. We have the Trapper Mine um, coal mining process. So this is what it looked like. Right, they're doing some mountaintop removal. But the reclamation process in the late 70s um, basically required any company that was mining for coal and, coal and ore had to basically reshape the mountain back to the way it looked before. So if you look down here, see if I can, if I can click on this and get like a better... Yeah. Well, uh, basically, they made it look like this afterwards, right? They had it, they put the soil back to where it belonged. They made sure to contour it the exact same way or as close to as possible as what it was before. And um, they put the soil back. They planted things that were native to the surroundings. Planted things that were native to the surroundings. And what was actually really interesting about this is that the animal, native animals to this area, plants, they all thrived. In fact, they were doing better than they were doing before. So I'm not saying that you know the cost of, of mining for coal and eventually putting that back out in the atmosphere, I'm not saying that it was completely offset by these animals doing better than before, but it is definitely something that is good, right? They're taking like the rocks and putting them back into the holes that they made and, and doing it like in a sensical way. You don't want to take all that topsoil that took hundreds, if not thousands of years to develop and just dump it in the bottom of a well, right? You want to make sure that you... Or um, you have water filtration that's appropriate. You don't have bad water that is full of like your, your acidic compounds you're using, just leaching and getting into like the groundwater. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using clay and stuff like that to, to seal things off. You want to make sure that you know things are ordered the way that they should be. If you're really trying to make sure you preserve um, the ecosystem, you want to try to make it as close to the original setting as possible, if not better. And it was good that these guys were able to able to make things better. This isn't just the company saying this. This isn't just uh, the government saying this. This is actually, these are conservational societies like the uh, Sierra, Sierra Club in, in Colorado was heralding that this was a very um, good success story for reclamation. So these, this is kind of like the new age idea of environmentalism. Right, where the economy... and the ecosystem, they are both happy, right? 
So this is kind of what you need to keep in mind, right? So big old smiley face. This is what we call a win, win, win situation. Not just win, win. Classic win, win. Only two people win, but in win, 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 three people win. So it's great. It's good for everybody. Okay. So good job. I hope uh, you learned a little bit and get ready for things to come.